I'm going to talk about tricuspid valve, the future of valves in this, the future of valve therapy in this arena. These are my conflicts. Oh, what's going on here? Well, you can have everybody move to this end, Roxana. So the tricuspid valve, the once forgotten model, has become the focus of attention for cardiologists and surgeons. The presence of significant TR does affect prognosis. Everybody knows that. An isolated tricuspid valve surgery is uncommon and associated with a higher operative mortality. Transcath therapies are therefore emerging as an, attract as an attractive, safer option. Now, where do we stand with transcatheter valve replacement? That's my topic. So many of the transcatheter mitral valve replacement platforms are being adapted for the tricuspid valve. And the transcatheter tricuspid valve replacement seems to be a safer and more effective in the tricuspid position than in the mitral position because of all the challenges of placing a TMBR. The clinical trials of transcatheter tricuspid valve repair and replacement are enrolling very rapidly, which just tells you how there's such a big need. And there will be therefore a role for both repair and replacement. These are the landscape of some of the replacement technologies. In fact, it looks like there's so many that are actually there are more there are more valves than patients. And so every day I find out a new patient, I'm sure there's some I've just missed out. Transcatheter repair is safe, but it's not always effective. So David Adams is the PI of the Trilumina trial. And here it shows you the data that it was actually extremely safe. The, even in the EFS, it was a 7% mortality at one year. SLDA was high, 7%, but the TR reduction was only 60%. Of course, it was better in the rolling data, it was like 73%. The class TR and the cardioband, similarly, not, the reduction of TR was moderate, but the safety was high. If you look at the transcatheter roll-in patients of 30-day outcomes, uh, this is the thing that David Adams showed. You can see over here that there was 74% of the patients who had actually two plus or less TR, and still about a, a moderate number of patients still remaining moderate to severe or even severe. When it comes to transcatheter valve replacement, it abolishes tricuspid regurgitation, so we know that. In fact, this is one of the technologies, the evoked tricuspid valve replacement, which is actually the valve which was invented for the mitral position, now used in the tricuspid position. You can see over here, it basically anchors the leaflets, catches, goes around it, and then once it creates a scaffold, you release the atrial side of the valve, and then the valve starts functioning normally. The valve is reasonably low profile, and it's extremely effective in reducing TR. This is an example of a case where you can see severe TR, and over here, the mechanism of TR is actually a pacing lead. And you can see over here, the pacing lead has been pinned on the side, and the tricuspid valve evoke has been placed transvenously through the femoral vein with complete abolishment of TR. The data, of, and this is the use of the intrepid Medtronic valve in the tricuspid position, and you can see over here, this valve was also used in the mitral position now has been evaluated in the right side. And you can see this is a transvenous deployment and leading to trace tricuspid regurgitation and placement of the valve. So the question is, what do we pray for? This is a transjugular deployment of the Monarch valve. And is Lars here still? Or he just left. Uh, yeah, he left. He just left. And this is the first in human case of an, uh, another valve we call Monarch. Uh, this is Brindarash Akwadi just done about just a month ago, and you can see this was a transjugular approach, and there was actually trace TR at the end of the procedure. When it comes to TTVR, is it effective, but is it safe? That's the big question. And you see when it comes to safety, you start looking at mortality rates of the evoke at 30 days, 30 days, major bleeding 12%, pacemakers somewhere around 8 to 10%. If you look at the Tricent EFS, the mortality was 3.6% at 30 days, major bleed was 26%, the need for pacemaker was 11%. And this doesn't include the patients who already had pacemaker leads in. So the pacemaker need may be even higher. But of course it was effective. You can see over here the survival over the six months was good. So the heart failure hospitalization was pretty reasonable. So it was effective, but there was a question about the safety. 
So that has led to the clinical trial, randomized trial of transcatheter replacement with the evoke valve versus medical treatment. It's a two to one randomization. So it's not one, it's a one to one randomization of optimum medical treatment versus optimum medical treatment plus the evoke valve. And the follow up is going to go up to two years and the crossover is actually at two years, not at one year. So that makes it a bit tricky. And this trial is still enrolling patients, but quite well. Just to put it into perspective, the other study called the Triluminate trial, which is a randomized trial comparing CLIP versus medical treatment, enrolled very rapidly. It's such one of the fastest trials that enrolled. And the study was over with over 900 patients. Right, David, correct? 900 patients total in Triluminate. Enrolled very rapidly. And that data should be available next year. Actually, yes, ACC, yeah. We hope to see it'll be in ACC. So what have we learned from replacements? We've learned from replacement, it abolishes TR in greater than 90% of patients. It's a fast repressive procedure like TAVI. Can be done more safely than a TMVR probably. It's a shorter learning curve than a TR. Less reliant on procedural imaging because you don't need to always have to capture the leaflets and potentially can treat a wider range of pathologies like huge gap in leads. What have we learned, but what are the challenges? Well, the challenges are afterload mismatch with low cardiac output. So if you have patients who are not euvolemic, who have severe RV dysfunction, when you suddenly abolish the TR with a valve, you actually can lead to low cardiac output states. The next is conduction abnormality with the pacemaker implantation. It's a very high incidence. It's clearly over 10%. And with some of the valves, like with the Intrepid, it's even higher. Valve can be canting and actually tilted and it can lead to loss of coaxiality with perivalvular leaks. There have been few cases of embolization of valves, and then of course, leaflet thrombosis, and finally bleeding, acute or chronic, because of large venous sheets and the need for long-term anticoagulation. The TTR limitations is large, very large annuli. So if very large annuli, you don't have valves which will allow you to do that. The RARV dimensions, there's a need for lifetime anticoagulants there's still a question about the durability of a tricuspid prosthesis. And finally, the, there's a risk of endocarditis. And if you talk to two of the surgeons over here, they will tell you most of the time when they deal with functional TR, they often land up putting a ring and not trying to replace the valve. Am I correct about that? So putting that into perspective, the, there are other solutions for as valves. For example, these are heterotopic valves and spacers which cannot treat tricuspid valves directly. So what there is, there are basically two valves in the SVC and the IVC, which helps in reducing systemic venous congestion without directly acting on the tricuspid valve. So see, these are some of the technologies which are available. This is actually one of the um, data sets using the trick valve, which is a stent in the SVC and the IVC. And there's some data to show there was improvement in functional class and improvement of quality of life with this therapy. Now, where do we stand between repair and replacement and what about patient selection? So if you look at this diagram, this is a tank which I used from Neil Pham. You can see over here that all patients to be treated should have symptoms of heart failure, preferably right. They should not have severe pulmonary vascular hypertension. That's important. If you have small leaflet gaps, mild tethering, and even RV dysfunction and have a contraindication for anticoagulation, those patients should be considered for repair. For the patients with large leaflet gaps, which are significant tethering where actually clips or even a ring may not work that well, then probably the patient should be considered for replacement. However, it is very important that these patients do not have significant RV dysfunction or they don't have a pulmonary vascular resistance greater than four. So that's somewhere we put with tissue selection. Coming in to work up for patients with severe TR, you have to assess the symptoms that these symptoms are coming from the TR. That means right heart symptoms. You should do a transthoracic echo and a transthoracic echo to understand the severe, severity, etiology, and the morphology. I think a right heart study is essential, especially when the patients are medically optimized, to make sure they do not have severe pulmonary vascular disease and to assess the LV filling pressures, because if the LV filling pressures are elevated, you need to still treat the left heart disease. And finally, a CT scan for those being considered for replacement. So I'd like to summarize by saying significant trisplastural disease affects prognosis. 
there's a need for minimally invasive transcatheter tricuspid valve therapies, there's going to be a role of both repair as well as replacement. And while we are waiting the results of the pivotal studies comparing medical treatment versus repair and replacement, there are novel devices and devices and device improvements are ongoing. Thank you very much. Thank you.